Hey everyone, my name is UJ Tucker, host of the UJ Tucker Podcast here, joined by my fellow guests. Uh, Nathan, Nathan Arroyo, hello. Salutations. That's awesome. Uh, as, as you all know, it's our yearly State of the Film Address, mm. where we break down our favorite films the past year, or films that we watched. Yeah. And yeah, we, that's usually how it goes. Um, so how, how, first of all, let me just, before we get into all of it, because we're going to do a breakdown of our favorite films of the year. Yeah. And we'll talk about, you know, our favorite, like, our top three favorite films and then get into films that we didn't really, like, that we aren't in my top three or in your yeah. top three, but are still good as yeah, it is. Yeah, that, that, that we, you know, saw and, like, maybe appreciated, maybe hated, despised, but, yeah. you know, runs yeah. a full gambit. Yeah. But what were your overall thoughts on 2023? 2023, I thought it was fairly decent, but then again, I might have just been, like, laughing at at the fact that like major studios and franchises were kind of like stumbling over themselves i found that comedic watching all these major franchises disney just kept losing money and i thought that was very fun to see uh but i think it was a fairly good year we got some decent stuff that i think will at least pave the way in the future for like maybe broader kind of like movies like directors getting more control and like being able to kind of like branch out try new stuff i th i think it was fairly decent fairly decent of a year. year i think audiences got sick of like stagnation and were like and are now craving a bit more from their media at least that's just my thoughts yeah i mean yeah, I think you're right. I think you're, I think that's a good point, and I think I think we discussed it last year as well. Where I think we mentioned how we're happy that superhero movies are not doing as well as they yeah. once were. And again, that's no shade to superhero movies. Obviously, some of my favorite movies are superhero movies. Yeah, like no. Spider-Man Two is still a great film. No, of and course. it's not even that much of a superhero movie. No, not you know? really. It's like there's still there's still some good stuff to be found, but like the factory of it is starting to lose gas and lose touch with what audiences are looking for i think and i think people are just tired you know i think i think at, awesome, at some yeah. point everyone was like okay avengers end game mm. that's it literally has end in the title and then they <laughs> yeah and then they released more movies through mcu and the dceu and everyone's like i gotta be invested more into this i thought it was it's, over with. It, everyone's just exhausted by it everyone's exhausted so yeah overall i think that's a good good example and honestly i'm happy i'm happy that yeah. audiences are now a little bit more intellectualized mm. and are craving more than just your standard superhero like hey good guy bad guy shoot a beam into the sky <laughs> you know it's it's good that people are, are craving and validating or wanting more you know yeah but overall 23 23 in terms of film has it been a good year for film I'll be honest with you. Yeah, yeah, go, you, you go first. Not really. <laughs> I, I uh, mean, I've been I've been criticizing 2022 films. I th remember last time we filmed this, I criticized 2022 films. And granted, I didn't watch that many last year. Yeah. Now, over Christmas break, I got caught up on a few, like, Tar. Like, Tar is a great film. I, I never watched I Tar, love Tar. Yeah. I mean, Kate Blanchett just killed it in a role. But also Babylon. I thought Babylon, Damien mm. Chazelle's Babylon was such a great film. I really wish I included that in my top end of the year list but again they released during christmas break so yeah. i couldn't include them but for some reason i think 2023 in film has been very perplexing to say the least where yeah. it, it, it doesn't feel as if there's like besides obviously barbenheimer where like obviously that was pretty good i'm not gonna lie and yeah. i say this as a guy that didn't watch barbie i still did not watch barbie i'm sorry <laughs> but i think you saw it that hey there was a there was a craze there was yeah. a, there were people that were involved and, and really wanted to support and dressed up to to watch those movies so that's great but other than that i felt like the year has sort of been a letdown yeah no i i i'd agree with you i'd say it was like almost like peaks and valleys like we peaked kind of with barbie and oppenheimer and then uh, we dip a little bit down there's nothing much their movies are still coming out but like there's nothing that like is really like reaching yeah i mean i remember from last year uh top gun maverick came out and i think yeah. that was like what allowed cinema to come back right mm -hmm. that was sort of like like a moment in time where like oh like a non-superhero movie that's still big budget can do well at the box office yeah. 
But I think in a lot of ways that that in itself was a moment, mm. similar to the moment of Barbenheimer. Um, but yeah, overall, it's it's been a very, I wouldn't say depressing year per no. se. But no, I wouldn't say it, depressing. I think that this is a cornerstone moment of a year yeah. where you can see the potential of films that are not superhero based mm. that can be made. And some of our favorite films of the year will depict that. So uh, obviously, as we did last year, we had our top three films of the year. And this year, we'll also include it as well. You want to go first with your, with your th- uh, third film of the year? My, my uh, oh, uh, start with my number three? Yeah. Yeah, sure. Uh, it was it was hard to choose this, because uh, we had a conversation early on, like, get your top three. And at the time, I was like, oh, yeah, three good movies I saw, this will be easy. Was not easy, actually. Yeah. So, coming in at my number three is is the Blackberry movie. Uh, this explain with <laughs> yeah no uh it's uh i don't know what drove me to watch it but i think i was just like i was marathoning like it's always sunny and i was like i know charlie day made a movie which was not that good awesome movie yeah, that was a full fool's paradise where he plays like the man who can't speak is it like, like a black comedy film kind of sorta it's like too it's too goofy to like be like any sort of like scathing commentary on like the Hollywood system and I was like oh that's kind of disappointing and then I saw Glenn Howerton was in a movie about Blackberry the Blackberry phone company and I thought nah I'll give it a shot and I was surprised it was actually really good Hmm. on the surface it looks like it's just kind of like egging off of like a social network kind of thing but that's a very small part of it uh, it's basically Glenn Howerton as like this ego maniacal kind of like businessman. The guy, there's the engineers making the BlackBerry phone. He comes in and he's like, "I'm gonna fund everything, but the thing is, I want complete control. I want the CEO title. I want as much control and power over this situation as humanly possible." And it becomes kind of this like just like hilarious odyssey of like a company's like poor mismanagement at the hands of kind of this dictator figure. And it shocked me and surprised me uh, in that regard. Uh, And so that's kind of how it uh, got into my uh, third spot. Third spot. Yeah, I feel like there's been a lot of like biopics this year. Yeah. In terms of like creating companies. I remember remember there was this movie Air that was like about Jordan with Ben Affleck and Matt Mm -hmm. Damon. I really wanted to watch that film, but uh, I, I, biopics for some reason they can be a little bit too boring on the boring end of things. A little boring, a little all like samey same. Yeah. Sort of all of them are trying to be like it's an underdog story, but mm. it's like how underdog can like a billion dollar company yeah. really be? Yeah, I feel like as you were mentioning, every, I think everyone's trying to ape off of Fincher's The Social Network. Yeah, no, that... especially with the tech side of biopics. Yes, I mean you see Steve Jobs uh, oh, with yeah. starring Ashton Kutcher. Yeah, there, there two. We had two Steve Jobs movies. <laughs> yes, like I don't know. I mean, I I mean this is going to be unpopular, but as for like a business figure, like Jobs is very like hmm. motivational. But at the same time, like, he's also a guy that I can tell, like, people don't like him, right? So mm. it's, it's like, how do you humanize him? How do you depict him? Like, that's kind of an uh, interesting point of, yeah. of discussion. Uh, but, yeah, that's your top the third. That's your favorite, third favorite yeah, film, Blackberry film. And who, was, who directed it? That was, uh, I want to say, Matt Johnson is his name. He's, like, an independent Canadian filmmaker. He did a movie a couple of years ago called The Dirties. That was like a found footage, like movie about kids being like bullied in high school, and like it kind of escalates to like a very terrifying sort of a climax. And I remember watching that a while ago and kind of enjoying it. And so, and he's one of the main roles in the Blackberry movie itself, and he plays it really well. It's like him and Jay Baruchel, who are kind of like the quote unquote founders of blackberry whose entire kind of like business gets overtaken by glenn howerton's like mm. psychotic ceo yeah all right can i say my top three yeah my, my third favorite. all right yeah. so heading into today's podcast it was going to be thanksgiving by eli Roth. oh nice. i really love that film yeah i thought it was great ascent rayer is like so so beautiful uh, <laughs> <laughs> she's beautiful mm-hmm. and she should have the career that tate mcray has right now um but 
I wrote, I recently watched The Holdovers oh, by Alexander yeah. Payne. Mm-hmm. And that movie is, it's a, it's a feel-good movie. It's such a great movie. If you guys don't know, it's about this guy, this character, who's like a junior or senior in high school. Uh, he's kind of a low-life, um, he's made plenty of mistakes, and he feels that if he makes one more mistake, he goes to like a military academy instead of, you know, going to school and going to like an Ivy League. So his mom decides to say, hey, like instead of coming home for Christmas or for the holidays, just stay in school and just be with this teacher. And you just see like a, an adventure between a teacher and a student as they like just go on hijinks and just just have like a good epic adventure. And it, it sounds very like, you know, cheery and all that, like, oh, like very feel goody. But it, it, the human emotions that are displayed by the main character, Sessa, some, something Sessa, I forget his first name. But Paul Giamatti just oh, yeah. stole Giamatti. this movie. I mean, the man is just, I mean, he's multi I mean, the first time I actually watched him was through Rhino <laughs> <laughs> and, and Tasm and Tasm 2. But this film is just amazing by Paul Giamatti. Paul Giamatti is very heartfelt. He gives a really great performance. And I mean, I don't know if he's going to be in the running for an Oscar uh, for Best Supporting Character or Best Supporting Actor, but uh, he's, he's an individual that definitely steals the show in this movie, and especially in that third act. You can t- definitely tell that there's a human emotion be- behind him and behind that character. So definitely go watch the holdovers. It's a gu- it's a feel good movie. The trailer absolutely fucking blows. Yeah, no, I the the trailer <laughs> sucks so badly and it does a disservice to the movie. But it's it's really good. Yeah, no, I because ca- I remember seeing the trailer a couple times and not being turned off by the movie, but being like, this is a weird trailer. Yeah, it's like it's like it's like, do I want to see this privileged guy just like go through like some ordeal that doesn't matter? And it's like, oh no, yeah, but no, there's actual human emotion. It's got it. like this like cheesy like voiceover like during Christmas, yeah, the, the students of this prestigious school. But that voiceover <laughs> guy is awesome, by the way. <laughs> that is, he does have a nice voice, but like that trailer is like really cheesy. But like I, it didn't like destroy my interest in the way i still haven't seen it but yeah. it is on my list of like things to catch up on definitely go watch it mm. uh but yeah it, it, it was filmed in massachusetts as well as like oh, some wow. like southboro mass like some private school in south Mass. but yeah definitely go watch it and how about your number two movie sorry my number two movie yeah that's gonna be uh yeah talk to me the uh a24 horror film i uh i saw it like three times in the theaters it really just kind of like took a hold of me uh did you ever end up seeing it no uh, I, well, I wanted to watch it yeah no it's what what subgenre of horror is it like slasher or sci-fi horror or it's supernatural or supernatural the the whole kind of premise is like kids have this like ceramic embalmed hand that they can use to uh like induce like a possession like they purposefully let themselves get possessed by ghosts because it kind of induces a sort of like physical mental high inside themselves there's like a very there's like a running subtext of the movie of like this as like like a party drug that kids use and eventually it like gets out of hand because some of the kids become like just super dependent on it in their day-to-day lives but um i found it just such a energetic like chaotic movie it has like this real chaotic energy and spirit to it that reminds me a lot of like the older evil deads with the way the camera moves so fast it's like weird like controlled chaos by the way evil dead it's like one of the best it's like one of my favorite horror films yeah I love I love Sam Raimi. But. Yeah, I, I literally have the Blu-ray. Really, right, right awesome. there peeking out. Hello, Sam. Awesome. Man. But uh, yeah, no, it was a, and it was a very like first feature from uh, I think the Philippu brothers, who got their start on like YouTube, just doing like little like YouTube action shorts, and so you get guys from the internet, the YouTube space coming in to direct an A24 oh, horror movie. Oh, I'm familiar with this movie. I'm, yeah. I, I'm, I'm, I didn't watch it, but I'm familiar. Mm. The more you talk about it, the more I'm like, yeah. Yeah, yeah, no, you're getting an sure. image in your head. Yeah, yeah. But, like, it's so impressive, like, especially for a first feature. Like, you watch the movie, and you would never guess that this is, like, first-time directors because yeah. everything feels so well thought out and confident, and they have some really great sequences. It's legitimately, like, I don't... Like, horror movies don't scare me often, but this one was, like, getting close to, like, really, like, there's some bone-chilling, like, sequences that, like, pull no punches. 
Uh, and yeah, no, that's that's why it's my uh, second favorite. Apparently, yeah. they're making like an expanded universe. Which I don't. I mean, here's the thing. Like, <laughs> I don't hate on that, right? Like, no. obviously, make your money. Yeah. But like, I think it should be done like in a tasteful way instead of just saying "talk to me too" or "talk to me yeah. too." Like <laughs> instead, of, instead of to me <laughs> to it's talk to me. To me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Like maybe doing like a more tasteful way because like yeah. Split is like a uh, sequel to uh, uh, Unbreakable. Unbreakable, but it, it doesn't portray that. No. It's not billed as that. It's until the last mm. ending where like, oh shit, like. Bruce like, Willis is in the movie. This this all tied together. Yeah, yeah. So I mean, I, if it's done in a tasteful way, I'd definitely do that. But like, mm. I don't know if like, I, I just feel like you're just milking the cow. Y- you know, yeah, dry. and so like, and like the announcement came out like immediately after the movie finished its run. It's like we're making a sequel. Like, hold do, on. Do we want to wait and think about this before we start throwing money at that too soon? Yeah. Yeah. But, all like, right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, no. Talk to me. I'm happy you didn't include like uh, the Exorcist or whatnot. Uh, oh, the Exorcist Belieber. Yeah. Yeah. No, I ain't touching that with a 12 foot pole. No, thank you, David Gordon Green. <laughs> I think that and, and like there's like a f- like a few like fan made like trailers of it, where like they were very disgusted by the movie, where they had like Imagine Dragons Believer <laughs> <laughs> at the end of it, at the end of the at the end of the trailer. Oh, that's amazing. <laughs> yeah. Um. So yeah, that's that's obviously talk to me to uh, talk to me. That's the movie that is number two. Uh, for me, uh, no surprise here, but I would definitely say Martin Scorsese's Killers of the Flower Moon mm. as my number two pick. I love this film. Little on the long runtime. Yeah, it's like three and a half hours, right? Right. But at the same time, like Scorsese is just such an auteur of a director. He's just so talented. Where it's like you can't really complain or criticize mm. him, right? Like, like for me, like he's in his late age like like late ages mm-hmm. like he's in his 80s right he he, he, go, he go he could go any second now <laughs> you know so i for one will cherish him you know yeah. and i think this movie really shows the beauty of of you know leo dicaprio's character work as an actor but also who's i i keep forgetting like actors names but the 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 native american that is in this movie that's a uh, lily gladstone lily gladstone the female lead yeah. amazing she, i mean mm. definitely is going to be nominated for i mean not that oscars matter but <laughs> she'll definitely be nominated for an oscar if this if there's any mo- movie in this year that a woman or anybody should be nominated for it's her um yeah it was just amazing the cinematography was great I, there was like a moment early in the movie where there were a few Native Americans just dancing with oil because, like, their reservation was known for their oil, and mm. that's like how they accrued so much money and wealth. And a, a bunch of individuals decided to colonize that area and decided to make money out of it. And uh, the bit, the story of it goes is that Leo DiCaprio's character marries into this family that's pretty wealthy and decides to kill one person after the other in order to attain more wealth. Okay. So it's very dark, very disturbing, but still amazing. Um, there were a few issues that I had with the film, mm. but still, at the end of the day. It's great. And yeah. For what it was, it was great. And I highly suggest you guys watch it if you haven't already. Uh, I recommended it for my weekly pick, and I suggest, I still suggest it. It's it's a great film. It's not my favorite Scorsese film of all time. I still like Silence a lot more. Oh, yeah. With Garfield and Driver in it. Um, and I still like Wolf of Wall Street to a certain extent. Um, and then there's a few other Scorsese films, like obviously uh, Taxi Driver. Um, but yeah, this is still a great film. All right. Nice. And now what's number one? My number one. Yeah. Uh, this kind of came out of nowhere for me, but here it is. My number one of this year is going to be Godzilla Minus One. <laughs> really? <laughs> really, really. And believe me, I'm just as shocked as you are. Okay. Because, <laughs> like, just over this, like, course of this year, I've been slowly kind of getting into the Godzilla movies mm-hmm. and, like, just really just having such a great time because they're just such pure spectacle um and a lot of them like are very like very cheesy very purposefully schlocky because a lot of them are man in rubber suit fighting nine other dudes in rubber suits and destroying these elaborate small cities but it's such a great time and then that kind of changed when i saw shin godzilla which is like the modern uh update of that formula from japan and that was like almost like straight body horror and then they release this newest one godzilla minus one and i didn't even know going into it it's actually like a world war ii movie Mm. godzilla in world war ii it's like post 
post-war Japan. It follows the main character as like a disgraced kamikaze pilot who, you know, he survived so he didn't do his job that he was assigned. And it's sort of following his experiences in like a post-war Japan as they're rebuilding when at the same time, like now, Godzilla is going to show up and just wreck everything again. And a lot of it plays like, it's almost like you can see like this director wearing like the inspirations like on his sleeve not just from like previous Godzillas but it's like it's like a little bit of Jaws mm. as well just like that tension of an unstoppable kind of like force of nature there's like the third act is basically like Top Gun Maverick mm. where it's like a fighter pilot trying to take down this unstoppable force and uh, a lot of the Godzilla movies like it's spectacle over like human drama but this is the first one that has like a really nice balance between like the enjoyment of watching a giant monster wreck a city and also like kind of taking a moment to like look at the uh the human angle of that and like the suffering that these people are having in like a post-war kind of city uh and it and it shocked and surprised me and yeah no it's my number one for this year Nice man. Nice. Who, who directed the film? <laughs> uh God, I don't know the name, and if I try to pronounce it, I will. Is it fail. Japanese or something? Uh, Japanese, Japanese. Yeah. No, this is from Toho, the original uh, producers of all the Godzilla movies in Japan. Nice, nice. That's number one. Okay, number one for me. This yep. is this is easy one. Oh yeah. I, no. Everyone knows. I mean, I've I've said it many times on my podcast how much I love this film. But it's got to be Oppenheimer. Oh my god! It's got to be Oppenheimer. I'm I love shocked. this film. Yeah, I, I, I know, right? I'm shocked as well. Uh, it's great. I love this film so much. Yeah. I mean, I think the thing that I love this film a little bit more than Kills of the Flower Moon. Mm. I, there's still, I mean, Kills of the Flower Moon is still a great film. But the one, the reason as to why I really like this film is because there's a lot of like subtlety. And yes. It's it doesn't like ham fist you over with the messaging. Mm -mm. It's like, hey, like here's some, here's here here are scenes attached to this film come to your own conclusions mm. you could be right you could be wrong it doesn't matter yeah what matters is having an understanding of these characters and these motivations you know this the scene in which Oppenheimer is being interviewed at the press conference and he just oh, sees like yeah. a visualization of all these broken battered bodies mm. was just such an amazing scene to put in, in, into cinema like that was one of the most beautiful things ever like the way that he was hallucinating the, those scenes of just people's like charred remains mm. like it was just amazing to see even like the scenes in which you know him and Florence Pugh are like fully frontal nude yeah I thought that was great I thought that was a great touch because it showed them being vulnerable you yeah. know to me like I sort of like processes like oh they're like being open with one another mm. and they can't really be open with those that are around them yeah they can only be open with each other so mm. i i like that scene i understood what that scene was going for yeah. and even like the moments and like like rami malik like he had like very li limited screen time mm. but he murdered like he killed in that third act and a, a lot of people would be like oh it's just people talking and well, and and, like, and, and, and and it's like yeah who cares like it, i like that i mean i like the social network it's just talking in that movie yeah know? no it's like <laughs> like I it's love like that. that is the, the the action yeah i i i really love oppenheimer because I can see what Christopher Nolan wanted to do, and I think he succeeded. He wanted to take what in lesser hands would just be like a, a courtroom drama. Yeah. And he wanted to inject into that like some ferocity, just yeah. like it's like with the, higher stakes. Yeah, some high stakes and just like turn that into like a blockbuster yeah. for the year and he very much succeeded in it's that. a great film I, I love it so much and honestly like even though it's like three hours long like it does oh, not yeah. the pacing of it does not feel like three hours oh yeah no it does not stop it gets going right away yeah i mean josh peck did great i'm like well, oh yeah <laughs> yeah josh peck was great in this so movie. he's got like half of hollywood in half it. of hollywood casey so affleck good. shows up for like 0. 0.3 seconds yeah <laughs> There are a few people where I'm like, yeah, you 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 did some bad shit, you did some bad things, but like, <laughs> you're not, you're you're quite talented, and I I don't really hate on that. <laughs> or like you see like Manchester by the Sea, I'm like, oh, like maybe we should give like problematic people even more chances in Hollywood, <laughs> you know? But yeah, Oppenheimer is great. I really loved Oppenheimer, and yeah, uh, that's my number one. But we did watch that's other cool. films as well. Yeah. Uh, are there any films that you watched that, that uh, you enjoyed? Let's see. Uh, I remember you mentioned to me that you watched The Killer by Fincher. Yeah, David Fincher's The Killer. I uh, did not watch that. Explain. 
And did yeah, you like it? It's uh it's just it's Michael Fassbender as a uh as a hitman and uh it takes a very like mechanical approach to like the concept of being a contract killer. The movie is very like slow paced and Michael Fassbender the entire movie has like this this voiceover where he's like to be the perfect killer you have to have a very strict set of rules but David Fincher does a really fun thing where it's like it's it's like weirdly ironic it's like at times like darkly comedic mm. because throughout the movie Michael Fassbender is building himself up as like this this absolute professional this like human weapon who gets the job done but like it is the entire movie is just him fumbling the bag mm. at every conceivable point and uh i just found it very um just well put together like of course like david fincher his movies always like look beautiful and they're shot really well but i i really appreciated like the mechanical nature at which uh he chooses to show like this man's job he turns the idea of like the badass assassin into just like this like terrible like nine to five job mm. like <laughs> there's this there's this running joke throughout the movie where he's like renting different cars with like fake like ids and passports and like it becomes a joke at one point like he gives someone the idea and they're just like please enjoy your ride mr flintstone like the name of a cartoon character it's like very just like subtle touches like that yeah. and so uh, yeah no that's another that's movie i enjoyed you know who i would love to see david fincher collab with on a movie yeah ed rude baker <laughs> really yeah i think that would be great oh my god ed rude baker yeah and david fincher no, that would really yeah, like if they made like a movie adaptation of Killer Be Killed. Oh my God! Yeah, no, that would be that because like Blue Baker has perfect. done work before in Hollywood. I mean, he did that uh, miniseries with Refn on Amazon Prime. That's uh like Too Young to Die. Something yeah, like yeah, that? yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Oh, really? I did not know that. So I would love to see that. I would love to see like a movie adaptation of Killer Be Killed. Obviously, like comic booky but still like yeah. different and original but but like pulpy like neo noir yeah that, like, is something like that within like fincher's wheelhouse it, is it is it different from his previous work because I, I i like fincher but i've noticed that there is like a it's like scorsese with ga gangster movies where like there's yeah. a theme to it is this different than say seven and zodiac or like a person that's familiar with fincher's work can still be entertained by it you can still be entertained by it, but, like, it definitely is still very much a David Fincher mm. vehicle. Uh, like, I mean, the score is done by Trent Reznor, Atticus Ross. It, mm. it has those staples, but I think it's still just, like, a very solid, well-done kind of film. Yeah, Awesome, man. Any other films? Uh, let's see. Did you watch Bo is Afraid? Did not watch it. I want to hear your thoughts on it, though. That, that is such an interesting movie that, like, slides into a category of movie it's a I it's have. a like a cringe comedy kind of flick right yeah i remember like that's what i heard it's it's hard to put into a box it's like i i love this weird little i wouldn't say subgenre, but like directors well-established directors who kind of just swing for the fences with an idea the only other example i can think of is if you ever saw alex garland's men which is like yeah not a perfect film at all but like you can see he's just kind of letting his imagination and his ambition take the wheel for better or worse but like that's something i appreciate that we can get in 2023 is just a director just like unfiltered just like their imagination soar and Bo is afraid it really falls into that category I'd say the first hour is like nearly perfect mm -hmm. because it's just Joaquin Phoenix and you're seeing kind of the world through like his lens and it's just the most insane like people are on the streets just screaming it's covered in trash there's like people with ak-47s just walking around and he's just terrified the entire time and it's just like this escalation of just like the worst social situations you can imagine it. you can mm. imagine hitting like a peak uh but like after that first hour the movie kind of becomes almost 
this self-indulgent bit of a mess. It loses its steam. It's three hours long, and it doesn't keep up that momentum. But I'd say just to see where, like, Ari Aster's mind, like, goes, and it goes to some ridiculous places... <laughs> Uh, I'd I'd say it's worth a watch. Like I think most people will hate it, but it's worth seeing for everyone. Yeah, I mean that's the thing. Like I didn't watch it, but that's the thing with like movies nowadays. It's like why does everything have to be like three? It's it's yeah. either like three hours or it's like an hour and twenty. Yeah, there's no like just release like a good two hour movie. Yeah, like, that, that... Well, not everything. <laughs> not every scene needs to be like this long drawn out thing. That that's part of why I liked the killer so much because I just see it. I'm like, oh, a new David Fincher movie. Oh my god, it's exactly two hours. That's amazing. Yeah. Holy shit. We need more of that. Like I don't want. I mean, obviously some directors get passes like Scorsese, Scorsese, Nolan. Nolan. They but, they can structure a three hour movie pretty well. But it's like not everyone deserves to have a three-hour movie. Right? Yeah. Like I don't want to see like an Ari. I mean, no offense, to Ari Aster. I mean, he's a great director, but I don't want to see a three-hour Ari Aster movie. Yeah, no. They, I'm not clamoring about that. It it, it could definitely be cut down. Yeah. But like as it is, I I enjoy the ambition. Yeah, I enjoy its kind of unfiltered, crazy nature. What other films do you watch? Uh, let's see here. Let me pull up the list oh can we th talk about thanksgiving because we both saw that oh yeah great film i loved it oh so my much. god i love that i love this film so much i watched it on thanksgiving break actually. <laughs> it's great time to do it yeah it's a great film yeah. i think one of the reasons as to why it's it's a great film is because obviously it's not anything new or innovative no it's a it's a good slasher film uh but the reason why i loved it so much is because there's character motivation in it yeah and you understand the reasons as to why the killer did what he did. So if you guys don't know, there was like a Black Friday sale and his wife died, yeah. essentially. Uh, I'm kind of spoiling the movie, but you, but whatever. You can still follow along. But And he picks out people that were in that video that publicized his wife being killed, and he decides to go on a murder spree about it. Mm. And it's great. And obviously there are issues with the film, especially in that third act. Like how did oh, the killer yeah. go from you know being in this abandoned like dungeon that's like sheltered and like away from like the rest of society back to the police car because spoiler alert so <laughs> close your ears uh the killer is is the sheriff the sheriff is shown to be the killer mm. and it's like there there are moments like that where i'm like okay like how did that happen or how did the main character in the film who is always on her phone and like and it's part of the generation of always filming mm. things on her phone how did she realize to film it on her phone to show to the people that he was the killer like how did that happen yeah you know there are certain moments in the film where i'm like okay that's kind of like not believable but it's still a great film i love it yeah no it's it, a great film it's so much fun and you can tell eli roth he he wears his influences like on his sleeve like he you see like so many references in that movie to like halloween mm -hmm. to scream it's very like the classics the, the, yeah some classics the first two acts i think are like really like some airtight like slasher work some mm -hmm. really like fun kills like the thanksgiving day parade oh, is so great. glorious it's such just like i'm surprised you didn't mention the mom being cooked in the oven that was oh awesome my God. and even yeah. like there's like subtle comedy in this movie as well like oh yeah like where she's being cooked in the oven and like all of you all of a sudden you just hear a ding <laughs> yeah. to say that's ready and cooked he, he, that was great he stops the oven just to put in like the the, the ding the, the, the turkey thermometer great uh, and so also funny. the i wouldn't say the trailer but there was like a little small video that he made on his youtube channel about the film before it was oh, made really and it's even i would say like darker than the actual film oh, but it's still great i love it it's a great trailer for like so a great. made up movie <laughs> that was 13 14 years ago uh, but yeah, Thanksgiving, great. I was going to include my top three, but then I watched Hold Over, Holdovers. So yeah, I and you, you had to egg that out. Yeah. I Again, it's you. not the most innovative slasher film. Obviously, yeah. like Scream and Halloween, as you mentioned before, are better films. I mean, they are. Um, <laughs> but Thanksgiving, great. I mean, and plus, Eli Roth, like, who knew? Like, he could, he had yeah. it in him to like, I, release a great film like that. I, I love me some Eli Roth. He's definitely not the best director. This You could argue Thanksgiving is, like, his first, like, good movie. Yeah. But, like... All his movies kind of just have this like, nah, like, nah, fuck you attitude. That's just like, I'm gonna make what I make, and you're gonna love it. And it's like, 
I do love this trash. Thank you, Eli. I couldn't help. I couldn't help but notice that like the Milo Mannheim guy, you know, the guy, the dark hair guy, who was like suspected to be the killer. Oh, in the movie. yeah. He reminded me a lot like Justin Long. <laughs> I feel like every like horror movie nowadays has like some Justin Long has a, has a archetype. Justin Long type. <laughs> <laughs> like it just reminded me of that. I, I honestly think that the, this movie was a little bit better than the, the Lazarus movie, in which you said it was your favorite movie. Which one? I forget the name of it, but it was like in a in a abandoned uh, house where it was like a dungeon and there was like a creature in it. Dungeon creep. What were we talking about? <laughs> Is, is that Barbarian? Yeah, yeah. That's fair. I'll give I, that to I you. I actually prefer this movie over Barbarian. I'll give that to you. In a fight in a fight between these movies, Barbarian, Thanksgiving, I can see Thanksgiving yeah, I can... topping over that. That's fine. I'll give that All to right, you. All right, one other movies. Yeah, no. Uh, do you have anything on your list? That's it for you? I mean, I got more, but like, I don't know. You, you got a list you, right there. Yeah, I'd, you like can, to, you I'd can... like to hear from you, my friend. All right. Um... Uh... All right, so there's a few movies that I watched uh, earlier in the year. This was like back in like January, February, maybe March. I watched this uh, PG-13 horror movie called Megan. Oh my god! Or it's like sci-fi horror, but it's 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 not that bad for what it is. No, it it really. Th- I watched that too, and it shocked me. Like, cause I really had a good time with it. Yeah, it was a fun. It was like for what it was, it was mm. not that bad. I mean, I remember the screening of it. And that's all I remember. Yeah, not the screening, but when I watched the movie in theaters. There's a bunch of like ten year olds there, it's, just on yeah. their phone, like TikToking and Snapchatting away. I'm like, guys, like, I've realized that I'm the old one now in theater. Yeah. I'm the old curmudgeon <laughs> oh, guy god. in theaters that's like, oh my god, these fucking Gen Z kids. Ba- back in even my though day. I'm Gen Z, you know, <laughs> <laughs> like it's like, yeah. So that's 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 what I remember from Megan. It's it. I mean, it it was good for what it was. Yeah, no, for what it was. I appreciate that they leaned into like the cheesier aspects mm-hmm. of the concept and just like it played more as like a dark sci-fi comedy than a straight horror movie and it, it's better for that i'd say uh you watch barbie barbie i did watch barbie yeah. all right explain it barbie because <laughs> uh... <laughs> i'll be honest with you can i just be honest for you a can second? be honest can, yes. I be honest? can i be honest i've been lying for like the past 40 <laughs> minutes 30 minutes uh i feel like with barbie the thing with barbie that i, I don't really understand is that like i feel like everyone has a think piece about it Mm. where everyone has like their own like piece on it where like oh the barbie is a feminist movie or the barbie shows anti-feminism like can we just watch a movie without like having a think piece attached to it like can we just watch a movie without anybody like putting like their two cents into it does everything need does every every movie need a think piece does every movie need a video essay to document like people's thoughts it does not (laughs) a movie that's designed to sell toys is like deserving of a think piece yeah like, maybe I'm victim to it as well because there are times where I do go into, like, video essays about, like, why Spider-Man 3 is one of the best Spider-Man movies of all time, you <laughs> yeah, know? Yeah. There are times where I'm victim to it as well, but it's, like, not everything needs a video essay. Not it, everything exactly. needs a think piece. Like, just enjoy it for what it is mm. and go on with your day. Yeah, that's... My... I say this as we make a podcast about our best films of the year. <laughs> our, our, our hour-long think piece about all the uh, movies. Yeah. But Barbie, I enjoyed it. I really did. Um... I felt like the aspects of it that were trying to be like more sentimental and like introspective of like, what does it mean to be alive? What does it mean to be human? Those kind of felt very surface level. And I feel like it clashed with like the more absurdist comedy aspects, which I thought were the most fun in that movie is when it's just being like live actors pretending to be toys in this yeah. fake plastic world that's where a lot of the imagination a lot of the fun of the movie is had of course everyone talks about ryan gosling yeah he's he's chewing up scenery like it's nobody but nobody's business and it's so wonderful margot robbie yourself is also very fun and very funny in the movie but it's like she is one-dimensional though and her acting. Because the- oftentimes when I see her act, it's usually with, like, mm. a Jersey girl accent. Yeah. Like, you saw that in Wolf of Wall Street. You saw that in Babylon. Every time she's shown up as Harley Quinn. Yeah. yeah it's like Jersey. It's like, uh, she's a good actor, right? Mm. And it's better than, like, having Amy Schumer be the Barbie, right? <laughs> Apparently that was, like, reports, earlier reports of the movie that, like, Greta Gerwig wanted to have Amy Schumer to be Barbie. I'm like... I don't know if you want to have that Zionist in a movie. <laughs> I mean, if, if you looked at Amy Schumer's Instagram stories, you're like, is she a comedian? Like, I mean, why why are you, like, <laughs> making, like, 30 Instagram stories about, like, Israel and, like, how, like, we should, like... I mean, I don't... I don't 
care about like the Middle East. I'm sorry, I just don't. But <laughs> I just I have my own problems at home. But <laughs> I, I just I just don't care. Like I, I just don't care. Amy Schumer, if you're watching, <laughs> stop posting Instagram stories about the Middle East. All right, release a special. Show people that you're funny. Okay. But um, yeah, I, I just think that it it is um, yeah. I mean. I think Margot Robbie is quite one-dimensional, but that that doesn't mean that she's a bad actor. I don't think she's a bad actress. I think just a lot of movies just like use her all kind of like the same way. Yeah. But yeah, no, Barbie. I did enjoy. Uh, if there's something in the movie that I didn't like get or connect with, it's probably because. I'm definitely not the target audience mm -hmm. of that movie, and that's like it's not a knock against the movie, just because like I, I, I wasn't vibing with the turmoil that is a mother daughter relationship, because yeah. I am neither a mother or a daughter. But I'm like, <laughs> but I'm, like Barbie, it, it was, it was, good, good I give it a thumbs up. It's, yeah. I mean, it's good. I mean, I'm happy that people are watching movies that are not like superhero movies. Yeah. I mean, it's good. It's good to see people have an interest in cinema and watching movies in the theater because I know, like, we like to often rib, and you often rib about, like, no one saying, oh, you got to watch it in this environment or in this theater <laughs> or in this aspect ratio. And it's like, at the end of the day, just watch a movie, right? Yeah, just watch the movie. And in, if you enjoy it how you saw it, then you're doing movies correctly. But still, I prefer, like, watching movies in a theater, you know? Yeah. Like, I, would much, I would much rather watch it in a theater than watch it, like, on a. But you know, I think it's good to like watch a movie for in a theater. Or, you know, I mean, we we have Blu-rays right here. You know, oh yeah, physical so, media. Always, yeah, very important. Uh, yeah. <laughs> anyways, I just admitted to that. Uh, anyways, um, what other movies did you watch? Let's refer back to the list. Uh, oh, there was a John Wick Four that came out this year. I almost forgot about it. Did you? I feel like it ties in with another action movie that I watch as well, really? which is uh, Mission Impossible oh. Dead Reckoning Part 1. Oh, you watched that? Watched it in the theater, and I don't remember anything about it. Yeah. <laughs> I, that's the thing with action movies nowadays. I don't remember anything about these movies. I, I, I like Tom Cruise. I think mm. he's a great actor, and I think he's the last true American actor in cinema working today. Mm. Kind of far fetched. Maybe people disagree with that, but I think in terms of like box office draw, yeah, no, he, in he, terms of inspiring people to go to the box uh, to the movies, mm. I think he's the last guy. And I know he's kind of questionable, and he has questionable practices and <laughs> religious views and whatnot. <laughs> but I don't care. <laughs> <laughs> I can excuse he, questionable he, views with greatness. You know, he he is making some good movies. He he's the reason Edge of Tomorrow exists. Mm. That's a great movie. And so yeah, like as crazy as he is he's making legit movies for people but i never i didn't watch dead reckoning uh but you say it was but how was john wick john wick 4 uh forgettable i wouldn't say it's forgettable because the action of all the john wick movies is always like top tier like the first hour of that movie is just one long fight scene within this hotel in Japan and the choreography, the stunts, the setups, the general look of the movies, like the way everything's shot is always so, so well done. Again, top tier. Everyone's working at like the height of their like talent. It's just that it definitely feels like the franchise itself and the movie like overstays its welcome. Cause there's really like no, intrigue into the world anymore and you can tell by watching like even Keanu Reeves looks exhausted but like again you're watching these movies for the like some of the best action you'll mm. see on screen you're not watching it for the story which will sometimes rear its ugly head because it's like it feels like John Wick just going on video game side quests. It's like, John, you have to get the thing from this guy, so you have to travel to Amsterdam to get this thing and fight this guy so you can get that thing from this woman so you can be a part of this club yeah. so you can go there and there and fight Bill Skarsgård. At some point, we're going to introduce nine different characters. Are we going to give them all spinoff movies? Maybe. We might. We we might make the Peacock show the Continental, <laughs> which Pete exists. Davidson is in it. He <laughs> is. Pete Davidson plays in. Jesus No, Christ. it's a joke, but it could happen. <laughs> no. <laughs> knowing, knowing Peacock and knowing NBC and you know, the powers of Lauren Michaels and any, oh, anything that happened. God. Um, 
but yeah, anyways, that, that could happen. It could. It could. <laughs> but yeah, those are my thoughts on John Wick. Great for the action. Everything else is like forgettable go on your phone during all the talky bits mm, yeah no one will judge you yeah i mean franchise franchises should die it's, it's <laughs> franchises should die there's no reason to have like four john wick movies yeah there really aren't <laughs> there's no at, reason no one's all. clamoring about it the first john wick was cool it, it second was john wick cool nice cool third but, john wick okay hopefully this is the end the yeah. fourth john wick it's like okay like what are we doing here like we can't just i, I know like we we keep saying the the the, the phrase don't milk the cow dry but it, sometimes you got to realize I and mean, i hate to use like farm terminology here but yeah sometimes you know, hogs get slaughtered, you know? <laughs> and now the John Wick franchise is a hog. You know? it's, yeah. and it They is. should have done what the Wachowski sisters did to Matrix Resurrections, right? They, oh they should God. have been more meta about it, you know, we're, like have like like references to Warner Brothers and shit like that in the movie. That was just, awesome. They, I love where that. Where they just make like a pure parody of what like the average like reboot remake requel would be yeah that's i i <laughs> i go back and forth with matrix resurrections between yeah. this is genius and god this gives me a headache which i guess if they re <laughs> I, I honestly i believe in this wholeheartedly if they like rebranded the name matrix resurrections to deadpool 3 People would love that. They would be like, oh my God, Ryan Reynolds is like an auteur. This guy is like a, a pioneer of indie cinema and of, of exploiting and showcasing the true grittiness of of these remakes. Like, honestly, I truly do believe in that. If they just rebranded as Deadpool 3 and with the same script, but just like references to the Deadpool universe, it would be viewed as like, oh my God, Ryan Reynolds what is exposing. A game, what a game changer. He's exposing the Hollywood industri industry. <laughs> this is this the modern day version of Eyes Wide Shut. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> That's what it would be. Yeah. But yeah. Anyways. Oh god. <laughs> am, am I am I lying? You, am I am I joking? You, I mean, you are joking. on to something there. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm sorry, man. Like, <laughs> I'm sorry. Um I did watch a few movies. I, is yeah. that the end of your list or are there more? Uh I got a couple more, but it's like nothing really nice. to Infinity Pool made You watched May December, right? Yeah, I'd watch May December. It was a kind of a dark film. I'm not gonna lie. It was very. I was not expecting. It's weird because Netflix has it as like. Oh, and you watched Knock, Knock at the Cabin. Yeah, awesome. Knock at the Cabin. How was that? I, I yeah. I've. I'm not gonna lie. Mm. I had my issues with the film. Okay. Is it the best M Night Shyamalan film ever made? No. I still no. like Signs. Signs is my favorite M Night Shyamalan film of all time. Go argue with your mother. I don't care. I I love that film so much. <laughs> I can watch that film. I I I watch that film at least once a year. Mm. That's how much I love that film. Science is his best film ever made. Yeah. Um, but I, I, the Knock at the Cabin, I've heard not so good things about. You didn't uh, see it, right? No, I didn't. No, you didn't. That's, <laughs> that's fine. Uh, I love M. Night Shyamalan. I've come to accept that like his weird choices with how a scene is shot or like how dialogue is made and delivered, that's just him. That's what he wants to to do for the scene and I fully accepted that. Uh the movie does like have like kind of a cool premise. It's a gay couple with their child and like this this group of four people come and they're like you have to sacrifice one of your family. <laughs> what are you doing? Oh so Opening you... the list. You can just use the thumb. I'm not hiding anything. <laughs> but like it's the cult uh and they come they're like you have to sacrifice one of your family members to stop an impending apocalypse and uh Dave Batista is the lead of this cult. He's easily the best part of the movie. Like, Dave Bautista has slowly become, like, a legit actor who, if I see him show up, I'll be like, I kind of want to watch this now. And I think the movie starts off pretty well. Uh, he's just got, like, a very nice eye for suspense and escalation, but eventually that kind of peters out a little too soon, and we're just kind of like we're trapped in this cabin and we're just kind of having like the same conversation over and over and over again. And a conversation in an M night Shyamalan movie is like, 
it could be like nails on oh, a chalkboard. It's, I mean, we watched it all together in the theater, just, and there are moments in the film where I'm like, that's not how children talk. That's like, that's not how human beings that's not how talk human at beings night. Are, no. <laughs> but yeah, you, you thought it was okay for what it, it was. It, it was okay for what it was. Again, the, the M. Night Shyamalan-isms are like, you love them or you hate them. I love and hate them simultaneously. Hmm. Like, I find myself, like, laughing at the movie when it definitely does not want me to be laughing. Yeah, yeah. It's been an interesting year for horror because there's been some yeah. good horror movies, as, mm-hmm. as you mentioned before Thanksgiving, Megan Twister to an extent. Mm-hmm. But, I mean, there's been a lot of crap horror movies. There, ha- I haven't... Like I haven't seen anything that I like. I saw really Five hated. Nights at Freddy's that you. Oh put in my the god, list. that does not even count as go a about it. Movie. Go explain. Uh, gamers should not be allowed to leave the dens where they reside. They should not be allowed to make movies. <laughs> From what I know of this movie, is that the creator of the game was like on set, and he's just like I. He's like he was given like creative control, and oh, no. usually. When a creator is given, like, control over an adaptation, I'm like, oh, thank God, that's good. Like, there's some integrity in Hollywood. This guy should not be allowed near a movie set or a script or a computer. He shouldn't even be allowed to make the, these terrible games. But there are people that say that it's a guilty pleasure of theirs or that it's <laughs> underrated it, for what it is. <clears throat> uh, is it? Is guilty it? pleasure, I can understand. I did laugh a thousand times during that movie. It is entertaining, but, like, the very concept of just, like, it's, like, a faux Chuck E. Cheese place with killer animatronics. And it's, like, that could be a really, really fun concept that you can do with uh, a horror movie. And, like, the animatronics in the movie, they're done by Jim Henson's company. They look great. Mm-hmm. And they, like, function terrifically when they're allowed to do things. But they're in the movie for, like, ten minutes. Really? That movie is like 90% Josh Hutcherson falling asleep and dream sequences, and it's a nightmare to get through. Matthew Lillard does show up for 10 minutes of runtime just to cheese things up a little bit. All He's like this close to making the movie bearable. Mm. Yeah. But like, un- unless you really love that FNAF lore, you can skip it. Yeah, yeah. All right, there are a few movies that I, I also want to discuss as well. Please. I watched. Um, I mean, anybody who's who who knows my podcast and has seen me all my podcast episodes knows that uh, knows my opinion on Asteroid City, mm. Wes Anderson's movie. I watched it with Ethan. Oh, okay. And it sucked. I hate it. <laughs> the more I think about the movie, the more I fucking hate this movie. It's so bad. It's honestly like a more highbrow more cleaner and i mean obviously it's wes it's wes anderson it's, so yeah so you know that the the cinematography and all that the visuals are gonna be great but honestly i thought it was a more visually appealing episode of the big bang theory like it Bru- felt like that jeez that it is felt scathing. like where, where it's just like brian Cran- I, mean, I like brian cranston he's good but there are times where you just watch it and the dialogue is just like we're very smart and we're smart and sophisticated and we're nerds and we're geeks and bazinga and it's like I don't want to watch this like it's it's honestly Wes Anderson at his at his most cringeworthy I I don't know who Wes Anderson surrounds himself with but it's just like the, it's just such a meh movie yeah that it made me really hate it made me rethink everything about Wes Anderson after watching this movie I dislike this movie to the highest regard and. The fact that people are like, oh, well, actually, it's a good movie. It's a good movie. I'm like, oh, one nude scene of ScarJo is not enough for me. Like, I'm sorry. It's, it's got to be more than that, you know, you, you, for me to you, like a movie. You can watch uh, Under the Skin. That's a great movie. Yeah, if, if that's also, by your metric. If that's it also your metric. features nude Scarlett Johansson, <laughs> but there's also a good movie around that. Yeah. But, yeah, no, I, I didn't end up seeing it just because every time I saw a trailer for it, it, like, went through one ear <sighs> and right out the other. I, th- I, I hated it. So, I mean, it's so, it's like, it's literally like, I wish I caught that like two hours, but I don't know how long the runtime was, but it felt like a three hour movie. Oh Lord. <laughs> not good. I, I did not like, it. I did not like it at all. Uh, I also watched uh, The Machine with a bunch of my comic buddies, in- Ethan included. Uh, it's directed by, not directed by, but it stars Burt Kreischer. Oh yeah, Burt. 
What what was that movie? I never watched it. It's about it, him but I just being kept involved. Seeing it. It's about him being involved with the Russian mafia, essentially. Okay. And the story of that, and it, it's obviously a, it's based on a true story, so you know that there's a a lot of fictionalized B- based embellished. on a true story. True yeah. story. Yeah, yeah. I mean, hey, <laughs> it yeah. is what it is. I don't I don't mind comedians embellishing jokes and whatnot. Yeah. As long as it's not like Hassan Minaj, right? Where like you lie about like being a victim of like a hate crime or something like oh, that. God. If you lie about that in your jokes, I'm like, okay, that that's where I draw the line. But if it's like a tongue and cheek kind of joke, I don't mind it. Yeah. But uh, Machine, for what it was, I didn't mind it. Mm-hmm. Um, it was like I, I watched this like in a dead theater where like five, like ten people max, <laughs> and like somebody like stole our row of seats. So I'm like, okay, fuck it, like we'll just say wherever. <laughs> um, but. For what it was, it was it was a it was a watch, you know. Okay. It, was, it was like a nice, entertaining watch for what it was. I don't I don't expect that much from a Burke Crusher movie. Like <laughs> for the people that were like, "Oh, I was let down by by this movie." I'm like, the movie that stars Burke Crusher in it, like the guy that's like known for partying and drinking, like that's it's the guy the, that you're let down by. The guy who takes off his shirt and all of his his Netflix specials. Yeah, <laughs> all of it. <laughs> I think I think mo- I don't know. All I see is when Netflix recommends Burke Crusher, just like, look, fat guy with his shirt off. I'm like. <laughs> that makes me uncomfortable, but thank you. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I don't blame you for that. But <laughs> for what it was, I didn't hate it. I mean, okay. it's a Burke Crusher movie. Like, what do you, I mean, if it's Wes Anderson, like, I, my expectations are quite high, <laughs> even though they shouldn't be. Yeah. If it's PTA, sure, I understand that. But uh, it's a Burke Crusher movie. Burke like, Cr- <laughs> you can't expect, like, um, especially for Burke Crusher, because it's one of his first films made in theaters. Like, you can't expect, uh, you know, Punch Drunk Love out of Burke Crusher. No. <laughs> no. You can't expect uncut gems from Burke Crusher. Like, I'm sorry. Like, uh, understand your expectations should be at, at, at a reasonable point. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, but, yeah, that's other films that I watched. Um, I, I watched a few uh, Hindi films as well. So, I watched... Oh, okay. Uh, so... You you won't know th- these movies obviously. I won't, but, but I'm, I'm so. Uh, Patan yeah. is really good. It stars Shah Rukh Khan, which is like the biggest like actor in Hindi cinema. I think he's like top five, well most well known actors. Uh, and it's, it's considered like one of the reasons as to why Hindi cinema got like a resurgence in the box office mm-hmm. is because of that movie. Uh, it's an action uh, set piece film, really good, really good performances. Um, yeah, it's it's good for what it was, and mm-hmm. it was released in January, so a while back, like 10, 11 months ago. But still, great for what it was. Great movie, great movie. And uh, To Juti Me Makar, I watched that movie, which is like a rom com kind of movie. I mean, Hindi cinema is like known for its rom com aspects mm-hmm. and like for its films and rom coms. Uh, it's it's definitely that. It's definitely a rom com film. So if you're a lady, definitely go watch it. For what it was, I I thought it was okay. Um, but yeah, that's about it for Hindi films. But Let's talk about super, superhero movies because sure. I've noticed a few on your list. I do have a, I have like two, two on there. Spider Verse right? and Guardians Three. You rate Spider Verse and Guardians Three as like some of your favorite film. I mean, yeah, quite highly. Which I, is I might just I'm I'm biased because I'm a fucking dweeb, hmm. but like I don't know the Spider Verse movies and the Guardians movies have always sat like away. From like the normal superhero movies, they have their own identity, their own like kind of vibe and character. They're very character focused. I've always appreciated that. They have more imagination. I really liked Guardians Three. That was that that was my time to jump ship from like MCU related stuff. I'm so sick of it. I don't care. I don't care what they're doing in the future with all these characters. They're not... Kang's nowhere to be seen now. So long, buddy. But um, it, it felt like an end, a definitive end to a long-running franchise. It wraps up the character stories in a neat way. Uh, I like James Gunn as a director. Uh, I'm, I'm disappointed that he's not just going to make original films, that he's gone over to DC to try to deal with that train wreck mm. but like hey good for him if he makes the money yeah but like i'd prefer he make like original movies mm. i feel like with guardians and uh of the galaxy films i feel like the the constant praise of the movies and for what it's been praised for i feel like we need to go back at the fantastic four movies back in the 2000s and uh. be like okay maybe these films weren't that bad because the things that Guardians of the Galaxy is being praised for, like the humor and the off-color jokes and the witty witty punchlines and mm. all that, those were the common complaints about Fantastic Four. Really? I remember 
I, it's been so long since. And I've I'm seen not. It. I'm not defending Fantastic Four. Obviously, it's not the best movie ever made. Like, no. I'm not talking about Fanforstic here. I'm not. I'm not <laughs> talking about that. I'm, <laughs> I'm talking about like the original 2000s films, where like Jessica Alba and like Chris Evans. Are, they're not the best films ever made, but I feel like the constant praise that I see from Guardians Three among superhero movies fans, mm-hmm. I feel like that should be directed to Fantastic Four, where I'm like, okay, maybe we should go back and watch these earlier 2000s films because at least with the earlier 2000s films with the superhero movies mm-hmm. at least they felt original yeah at least they felt like there they were actual people directing these films they had integrity to them a, somewhat a, yeah, so. <laughs> a little bit of integrity but like a little bit goes a long way when we're talking about franchise stuff yeah i, I, I think with superhero movies or just with guardians of the galaxy in, in general mm-hmm. i feel like there's always that moment where they're having like a heartfelt, genuine scene. Mm. And then at some point, a character just... Undercuts it with a joke. Yeah. Yeah. No, that's, and it takes me out of the film. very fair. That's the thing with Spider-Man films. That, mm. That's why I don't really like the D- Disney version of the Spider-Man films. Is because mm. they always have that one joke in the middle of it that takes me out of the film. Mm. You know, and, and that's something that you didn't get from the Raimi films. No. Like, Raimi films knew when to add the jokes and when they didn't. Yeah, no, the Raimi films played it all straight. Yeah. Like when you see Toby fight, Do- I mean Green Goblin mm-hmm. in that final like scene, like there are no jokes in it. No, no jokes. It's it, it's quite dark actually for what it was oh, for a yeah. kids film. That like scene between the two of them, where like Green Bo- Goblin's just like beating the absolute dog crap out of him. Yeah, that was a dark scene even back then. Mm-hmm. You know, so I, again, I think that that the constant jokes are like. And again, I say this as a comedian, right? I don't mind jokes in a film, <laughs> right? I don't mind jo- But I feel like if you're going to play a serious scene, let it be a serious mm-hmm. scene. I, I will say for Guardians 3, the first two movies have that problem, absolutely. Guardians 3 is much more straightforward. It lets its moments play out. I don't think there's really any scenes undercut by a joke at least none that i can remember it's much more straightforward which is why i think it's a it's a solid movie and a solid end to at least for me all that mcu stuff is mutant mayhem also a surreal movie oh mutant Mayhem. that's the teenage mutant ninja Turtles oh, animated yeah, 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 film yeah, yeah. yeah i feel like every ninja turtle movie i've watched is like <laughs> they're just trying to chase off the success of the 90s ones yeah, which are easily the best ones. Really are, yeah. Well, the first '90s one, solid. The second, even and Secret the of the third. Ooze. I thought it was not that bad. I haven't, I haven't seen that since I was like six years old. I haven't seen that since I was like yeah. a middle schooler. <laughs> I haven't seen, I, but I mean, for what it was, I mean, the Go yeah. Ninja Go Ninja Go song. Oh, fire! <laughs> Classic Vanilla fire Ice. Thing. He he had it. <laughs> yeah, I mean, for what it, I mean, at the end of the day, these like movies are just designed to sell toys, right? Like they they are true. So. You like Mutant Mayhem? I did. I it was a very fun animated film. Uh, the, the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles are actually like played as like as kids, and that brings like a nice energy and a lot of fun to it. And the animation style is is really unique. It feels like it's like graffiti. It's very like dirty. It feels like uh, like child sketches like come to life uh, a very well animated movie that i very much enjoyed and the score is also done by trent reznor and atticus ross mm-hmm. so if yeah, nothing get that bag get that listen bag to nine the inch score nails. because ooh, that score it, it kind of slaps it's 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 interesting to see the, the arc of uh trent reznor and atticus <laughs> ross. yeah like they went when they went from i want to fuck you like an animal to like making <laughs> teenage mutant ninja <laughs> turtles I'm, i yeah. want to fuck you like a turtle yeah, yeah. <laughs> 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 yeah, it's great, man. I, I like the career arc of that. Yeah, no, uh, that's like a more great. graceful way of doing it instead of like, I like Eminem, but mm. like you don't want to go from like like Eminem was a great rapper at a yeah. at a point in time. Now it's like he, he's made revival and all that, and you're like, okay, he's a former shell of himself. Yeah, he, he's better if he just did other things. Right? You didn't like the Venom song he did for the Venom movie? Oh, I love that movie. I I, <laughs> I love that song. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. I didn't, yeah, <laughs> yeah, it was what it is. But yeah. Trent Reznor, and Addicts Ross make that money. Um, what else? What other uh, Spider Verse? You watch Spider Verse? Oh yeah, Spider Verse. Again, those live away from the other superhero fair. Uh, multiverses came and went as they should have because it was a tired idea. But uh, I think. Uh, the Spider-Verse movies, they make it a bit more fun because it's not just an excuse to just 
cram in just like, ah, look, 900 actors mm. from these other movies. It's all very focused on the story. That stuff is just like, it's it's just like, it's, it's like just, it's the frosting. Yeah. And like, but the cake itself is, is, is delicious, I'd say. But I, I still like the Rainy films. Yeah, no, I'm not. Like gonna, the Raindrowski falling on my head yeah. scene, that montage. It, it, how can you rival that with any film? No, of you can't. The Disney or something. Yeah, of course not. You can't beat those, but I think these new additions are fairly solid. All right, all right. Um, you watched Evil Dead Rise, right? Yes, I did. All did right. you ever end up watching it? Did not. I mean, I didn't see Raimi's name attached to the project, so I, I didn't really. Really? He is a producer on it, him Produ- and Bruce Campbell. Producer. It's like, how much involvement do they have, you know? Uh, to my knowledge, him and Bruce Campbell are pretty involved. I think their idea is to like re reinvigorate Evil Dead. I think they had an interview where they're like they want to do like one Evil Dead movie like every three or four years, which is like franchise fatigue, but like yeah. it's it's a very fun movie, especially if you like Evil Dead movies. It's at times derivative of the previous formulas of people trapped in a space the, the new gimmick here is that it's in a high rise apartment building oh and so that that adds some fun elements to the front does it? it it does <laughs> all right we're going to take the actual evil dead screenplay but instead of a haunted house hell's kitchen apartment yeah we're going to do that it it adds we're some we're breaking the ground here <laughs> we're going to have a hell's kitchen apartment instead uh, <laughs> what? it's it's still a, a fun enough movie just like if you're just there for like the blood and the gore and the deadites who are just always the best part of these movies it's just actors uh the main actress who plays the main deadite it's like Alyssa sutherland i think she's absolutely phenomenal she is going insane in front of that camera and it's like magnetic so uh, again, yeah, it's just fun for like if you like over the top like gore and like silliness. And when evil lurks, when you oh that what was is that movie I never heard of that was an Argentinian horror film. I think it it was another like possession movie. Oh, uh, it's 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 hard to describe. It's like there's a possessed man in like this like uh, country like town this village in argentina and like there's a group of guys who like instead of waiting for like the exorcist that they've hired they just dump this guy's body and kind of like madness ensues because now the spirit is just free and like it makes a main point of uh targeting children specifically and the movie uh, goes insane like violence against children in movies is always very much a no-no thing this movie throws that rule out of the window and it gets very very dark and very very graphic with its violence in that regard and it's for that reason i was just like oh my god like taken aback because it was such a fearless way to go about things it's a brutal and uncomfortable movie to sit through but i'd say it's really worth it if you have an interest in these like horror movies would you say it's on par with possession or what do you say it's on par with possession possession that's the uh sam neil movie right yeah you're talking about yeah i think uh it's a different kind of possession movie it's more in line because that movie is very much like subtextual and moody and atmospheric this one's like balls to the wall bloody and like unapologetically violent it's more in the school of like like an evil dead kind it's more in line with like talk to me mm-hmm. like movies that are just mean spirited and relishing in kind of that concept i find it very funny that th- there's like talk to me and when evil lurks two possession movies and then exorcist believer which is supposed to be the possession movie, and that just shits the bed. All right, we'll round this list off. Yep. Uh, Cobweb. What's Cobweb? Cobweb. Yeah, that was a just a low budget horror movie, uh, Halloween kind of movie with uh, mm-hmm. Anthony Starr and oh God, Lizzie Kaplan as like parents with a small child, and the small child is like finding like 
secrets around the house and like is maybe thinking like his parents might be like very like terrible people who have done like a horrible thing it's uh yeah it's it's just a fun kind of like halloween monster movie it's very like halloweeny like if you've seen uh like trick or treats that movie it's very much in that spirit because like they have like a pumpkin patch in their backyard and all the pumpkins are like rotted and the dad's making the kid like dig them up and he's finding like bones in the backyard it's it's a very just like fun movie for the halloween season and last one uh extraction two yeah that's the chris hemsworth uh like action movies oh made okay. by netflix again like the story doesn't matter it's like he has to go fly to this country to save like this woman and her kids from a gangster it doesn't matter the action is just insane they have like a 10 minute one take where chris hemsworth is carrying a woman through like a prison riot it's like go to that scene watch it you can stop watching the movie that's about it awesome man so i think that's that's all the movies you watched yeah um heading into 2024 because obviously that's going to be coming up oh yeah what's what are your overall how are you feeling about movies heading uh, into 2024? What are your predictions? What do you want to see from movies heading into the new year? I think uh, because I think we both agreed like 2023 is almost like a transition yeah. period. Like totally. in the following year, like hopefully we see like more directors come in, like more movies being made that like really take chances, really give audiences some new stuff to see rather than just feeding kind of like this this hollywood like franchise machine like hopefully we're gonna get some very imaginative new stuff i'm not sure if there are any movies that you're looking forward to in 2024 i just don't know any movies that are coming out in 2024 like all, any no, rumored really prod maybe tarantino's 10th and final film oh, will come yeah. out i mean i don't know if it's coming out next year I pro probably not mm. but it's about like a movie critic or whatnot I don't, I mean, that's what i hear from reports yeah but I do feel like with movies nowadays, I don't know if it's just me, but I feel like everything's now like fragmented. Yeah. Where there's no like one specific thing like, oh yeah, let's rally behind this. You know, let's mm -hmm. rally behind this movie. Obviously there are a few flashes in the pen, right? Barbenheimer was like one where like, okay, yeah. people were really much invested in that. But in terms of like a single director or like a project, I don't think I see that. Yeah. I, I don't I don't feel like, like even like with the, maybe it's part of the internet, maybe like reason as to why everything's so fragmented is because like oh people have their own like subsections and whatnot yeah on the internet mm -hmm. but you know with like the 90s you know you had like you know boogie nights you know you had um you know tarantino's uh oh, i can't put a name to the face with uma thurman and oh kill bill yeah kill not not kill bill uh uma thurman pulp and fiction pulp fiction yeah. yeah like you you had moments and movements mm -hmm. or like oh like this stopped time essentially to like i know that's a cringe way of saying it but this is like this is like a moment like people are talking about it people are really engaged in it invest in this part in this in this movie but I, I feel like that's not the case anymore maybe it's the internet i don't know why maybe yeah I, you know what i blame I, I blame letterboxd i think letterboxd yeah. has done <laughs> more harm than good for films he as as someone with a letterbox that they check regularly, you are one hundred percent right. That place is a cesspool. It's really bad because it, it makes people think that okay, instead of like giving my actual thoughts on a film or construct it in a way that's really like in a in a in a, in a constructive way or criticize a film that's in a constructive way, it's just oh, let me go for like lowbrow humor, like let me just like oh, let me just recap this film in like this one sentence short uh, like tidbit. That does a disservice to the directors and to the producers of the yeah. film. You know, it's like they like a lot of people hate on Ryan Reynolds and his humor, but that's what I see from Letterboxd. It's just <laughs> like Ryan Reynolds' humor mm. in Letterboxd, and for some reason they think that they're more intellectual or more highbrow than the people that actually made the film. Yeah, so I think that that's the issue. I, that that's the one thing I want heading into twenty twenty four, and Letterboxd it it has done more harm than good for films. Yeah. Yeah, I, I fully agree. I go on Letterboxd. You'll find one of two types of reviews for a movie there. You'll either find someone just does like a three-sentence meme reference or someone else is going to write 12 paragraphs on something that isn't even in relation to the movie. Hmm. 
and at the end of the day, it's just going to give you a headache. I just go on there to induce migraines, honestly, at this point. It's just not, it's just not fun. Like, no. I never, I for me personally, I never understood, like, the appeal for letterbox in the first place i mean the the thought the original thought was like oh like a place where like people have different niche interest in films and we yeah. can like build a community and all that that's great but now it's resorted into something that's not what it was supposed to be it's, like it's essentially a circle jerk yeah there's no real that's discussion it. on it like you'll see someone give like a one-star review and then all the comments are just other reviewers being just like i agree with what you said i agree with what you said i agree with what you said you're right yeah, it, the the most like, the worst part about it, like the the one comment that I really hate on like Letterbox mm. is like when someone's like, "I'm sure the film bros would love it." I'm like, "What? What's so bad about a film bro?" Like, <laughs> like usually, like when I hear a film bro, I'm like, "Oh, that's a pretty good taste in and it's like art." If you're on Letterbox, art does that not make you a film bro? Yeah, Letterbox is the most film bro shit I've ever seen. <laughs> yeah, it's like I mean, all the movies that film bros like, I like as well. Does that make yeah. me a film bro? No, it does not. Like so, I, I don't get it. I don't like Letterbox. I think it's done more harm than good. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, overall, heading to twenty twenty four, I I I think now people want to have an experience while watching it. That's Absolutely. why I think we've seen a slow, you know, comeback of horror movies is because watching horror movies in a theater is so much better oh, than watching yeah. it at your home because you have other people where you're really reacting to things in real time. You know, when you see a jump scare or a horror scene, you know, you're able to be a part of a community and, like, react to the same things at the same time. So I, w I would love to see the continuance or the continuing success of horror movies. But also, I would love to see the start or the, the revitalization or the revival, I should say, of comedy movies. I yes. think we need comedy movies back in the cinema mm -hmm. because now I feel like a lot of people are sort of like, okay, like, it's comedy. Like, there's no need to, like, get mad about it. I feel like the Jennifer Lawrence movie was very underrated. No Hard Feelings. No Hard Feelings. Did you oh, watch yeah. it? I watched that too, yeah. I thought that movie was good for what it was. Exactly, yeah. It didn't take itself too seriously. Mm -mm. And I felt like it opened the floodgates for other comedy movies to have success as well. Mm -hmm. So I, I, that's what I really want to see as well. And I think in a lot of ways, horror and comedy are this, two of the same things. Oh, like, yeah. Two you sides react of the same coin. to the same thing at the same time. You know, like you watch not another teen movie. I, I I like that movie for what it was. Oh, that's a that's a solid parody film. Yeah, solid parody film. Really good. Really suggest you guys watch it. I mean, I, uh, I think the Wayne's Brothers also had a scary movie, right? Yeah, they did like the first two scary movies. Yeah, still good. The first scary movie still holds up. <laughs> you know, even like the Dan Cook movies, like back in the two thousands, like Employee of the Month. I like that movie <laughs> for what it was. I like that movie, and same with Freddy Got Fingered. So I would love to see the continuing success of comedy or horror movies, but also this, the a, start a, a of comedy A resurgence. Of, yeah, of better way of saying it. I would love to see a resurgence of comedy films. Uh, but overall, I, I'm going to be quite honest with you. My expectations for 2024 are not that high. No. They're That's not fair. that high. I, will, I would like to see like more original films. Mm -hmm. And I, there will be, but I don't think it's going to be next year. Mm, I'm... I'm hoping that when we get to 2024, that we'll get that we'll get some peaks, some peaks, but more valleys and peaks. In my, my more than likely, but I'm hoping that like what hits hits hard. That's that's my hope. That's your hope, and I think with that, that that comes another episode of the State of the Film Address. We're at an hour and sixteen. Hey, no, <laughs> we we filmed pretty long for this one. Have fun editing this. <laughs> uh, I will. I <laughs> that's this going to be very fun. Uh, but yeah, I think that that's it for us today, guys. If you have any questions, comments, or if you want to put your feedback as to what are your favorite films of the year. Or, Leave them down in the comments below. I'll do my best to respond to each and every one of them. I don't know if I will. I mean, it depends on the comment. <laughs> it depends on the comment. Like, I don't want to see like this film was gay. I'm like, I don't. This, I don't I'm not gonna. <laughs> I'm not gonna comment on that. I'm like, I'm gay. <laughs> I guess I'm gay for liking it. I don't know. Um, but yeah, that's it for for today's episode and or for this year's state of the film address. You know, there's some films that we liked, some films that we didn't. Uh, leave all the uh, films that we liked down in the, in the description box below. If you want to watch it, definitely go watch it. Um, other than that, that's about it. And we'll see you next year if we're still alive and kicking. Uh, exactly, yes. Yeah, we made another year of watching films. <laughs> so, yeah, that's it for us, guys. Thanks so much. Peace. See you all.